Hello, welcome. My name is Gavin Bannerman and I'm the Director of Queensland Memory. I'd like to start by acknowledging the traditional owners on the land in which we gather today and pay my respects, my respects to the elders emerging present. Um, the place that we gather today on Crawford Point where I'm sitting is a historically significant meeting, gathering and sharing place. And it's with that spirit that we continue that today. I'd like to extend my respect to all the places that you may be listening from for this presentation this afternoon. Uh, I would also like to just do some other acknowledgements, um, particularly for the Queensland Library Foundation in making this series possible. The 2019 Placemaking Fellowship was made possible by the generosity of our sponsors, Sekisui House Australia, West Village. State Library values the recognition and investment by the corporate community. A sponsorship such as this one demonstrates that sharing and celebrating our history has impact and meaning across communities. Thank you, Sekisui House Australia, West Village for your support. A reminder that the call for applications and nominations for the Queensland Memory Awards is now open. The awards, which include fellowships, awards and a residency are now available for you to apply. If you're interested in applying, visit the State Library of Queensland website. Or if you're really interested in applying and live locally in Brisbane, come along to our information night on Tuesday, the 23rd of February at 5.30 p.m. here at the State Library of Queensland. Information and tickets are available via State Library's What's On webpage. If you can't make it or live outside Brisbane, a recording of the event will be uploaded to the Queensland Memory web pages a few days after the event. And just a reminder that the applications for that close on the 25th of March. So, on to today's presentation. If you're from Brisbane or have visited Brisbane, you may be familiar with the Peters Ice Cream Factory site at West End. Peters Arctic Delicacy Company was actually made up of two heritage listed buildings, the Peters Ice Cream Factory from 1928 at 111 Boundary Street and the Cone Factory 1929 at 97 Boundary Street, West End. I'd like to introduce our placemaking fellow from 2019, Trisha King. Trisha is the, uh, is the placemaking fellow and her project is called Banging the Drumstick the creative and cultural legacy of the women and migrant workers of the Peters Ice Cream Factory. Tricia has worked extensively across the cultural sector, including as a coordinator of the Creative Lab in the Creative Industries Faculty at the Queensland University of Technology. She is also a professional artist and is currently in the last throes of her PhD. Tricia's current role is as lecturer in photography at the University of Sunshine Coast. I hope you enjoy Trisha's presentation. After the presentation, which goes for around 30 minutes, we'll be doing a Q&A session. So please forward through any questions that you may have. Thank you, and I hope you enjoy. Hello, my name is Trisha King, and I'm the State Library of Queensland Placemaking Fellow. I'm here today to present the work I've been researching over the past year as part of the Queensland Memory Awards. I'd like to start by acknowledging the always owner of the land on which we stand. My work today directly draws upon the stories based on Kurilpa and the surrounding lands of the Yagara and Terrigal peoples. However, I'd also like to acknowledge the Gubby Gubby land on which I personally live and work. This land has always been a place of learning and storytelling. It always was and always will be Aboriginal land. Now, I don't know about you, but to me, a Queensland summer brings up memories of a hot, humid, sticky time. I have fond memories of running under the sprinkler in the backyard, trips to the nearest coast to splash in the ocean, and licking ice cream off my fingers as it melted quicker than I could eat it. For many people, ice cream is synonymous with summer, a Queensland summer. They bring so many memories of childhood, an Eskimo Joe or a chalk wedge, and individually and collectively, these take on important moments of our identity and our belonging and our happiness. They can be very significant to us as a community. But ice cream as a point of memory and belonging isn't just for us consumers. On the flip side, for many production workers, the ice cream factory was a place of equity, hope and security. I've been tasked with gathering and telling the stories of 93 Boundary Street, West End, commonly known as the site of the Peter's Arctic Delicacy Co, or Peter's Ice Cream. Many of us would recognise these manicured lawns and iconic buildings 
but its importance extends far beyond the bricks and mortar to influence culture, community and belonging, and which helped to shape West End itself. As a placemaking fellow, it's my role to look at the factory as a space of stories and build up a community-based vision of the factory in how it contributed to people's lives and well-being and how it influenced the spaces around it. We all know that West End has changed dramatically over the last 20 years, but the history and the cultural significance of West End is something the State Library and others are continually working to record and preserve. The Peters building itself is heritage listed and in recent years has undergone renovations and being reinvented in a number of different ways. But beyond the physical buildings are the stories of the many hundreds of workers who occupied the space daily and the ongoing chain of influence which these people and their products have. And whilst I dug through the brilliant archives of the State Library's collection and that of other sources, this project has mostly been spent with my feet hitting the pavement and a voice recorder in hand working to document the lived experiences of the people within the factory and allowing not only their individual stories to be recorded, but gathering these stories together to form a collective narrative of the culture inside the Peter's Ice Cream Factory. So my project is called Banging the Drumstick, the creative and cultural legacy of the women and the migrant workers inside the Peter's Ice Cream Factory. And whilst I went far and wide looking for all the stories about the factory, I was very intrigued by the prolific employment of women and migrant workers throughout the factory's history. This equality in hiring and dedication to giving opportunities and fostering personal development from within its workforce set a culture inside the factory which not only set it apart from other companies operating during the same time frame, but it also influenced the culture in and around West End. But let's take a few step backs, however, and situate the site itself. The place we call West End is Kurilpa, an Aboriginal world meaning giant water rats due to the bush rats who ran up and down the riverbanks. Now the riverbanks themselves were a tangled mess of giant ferns and sandy beaches were lined with water lilies by the thousands. The river, as we all know, is an important part of Kurilpa as it allowed the Indigenous owners transition and movement, which is something that would also make West End a very attractive place to be post-colonisation. And after occupation by the Europeans, the land taken was used for farming in the area. The river provided that accessibility for boats to access and transport the crops. In the mid-late 1800s, cereal crops and a strong timber industry was the primary commerce, with local mills, pedigrees and parveries being within close proximity. So the town started to be divided up, and in 1846, town boundaries were proclaimed, and a few years later, a law declaring Aboriginal people and other nuisances was to be formally excluded from the town boundary at certain points of the day, with Boundary Street, the site where the Peters factory was later built, being that boundary line. And this sadly lasted for many years. During the growth of West End, migrants from Germany, Poland, Greece, Asia and Russia came to West End to work. Ferries began operating along the rivers and bridges were built, allowing West End to become connected to the city and its surroundings and really become this industrial hotspot. Towards the end of the century, the gas works, concrete pipes and glassworks moved in, the dry docks began operating and infrastructure was to built to support that. And again, it really drew people toward West End with its ease of transportation and connectivity. During the early 1900s, schools were built, the Boundary Hotel and the West End School of Arts are all established. Meanwhile, in Sydney, an American gentleman by the name of Frederick Augustus Follis Peters had moved to Australia and was starting to make ice cream in his own home using a recipe given to him by his mother. In 1907, he was working in his backyard shed making ice cream, which he would then deliver by himself in the afternoon by horse and cart. And in 1910, the Peters American Delicacy Company was formed. And over the next few years, Peters would commence to build factories in New South Wales and other states, harnessing that rapidly improving refrigeration technology. And whilst ice cream was a treat well loved, it was Peters' dream that ice cream would one day become an everyday treat for people. And that's where the Health for the Nation slogan was coined around that time, and it was used right up until the 1970s. In 1927, the Peters Arctic Delicacy Company was established in Brisbane, and a tender was put out for the construction of the building. Architect Eric Bowden worked with builders Richard Wilbridge and co to build what was touted as the most efficient and hygienic factory to date for just over 100,000 pounds. It opened in 1928, and a year later, construction began on the Cone Factory, which was fit adjacent. These iconic buildings and surrounding landscapes made the Brisbane site known as the Garden Factory due to its beautiful manicured gardens and a space that would host numerous worker get-togethers and Christmas parties. 
Interestingly, as Peter built his factories across Australia, each of these companies worked as separate entities in their own state. Frederick Peters, of course, maintained this strict quality control over the product, the marketing, the ingredients, the machinery, but the operations of the sites were fully autonomous. He did visit the sites so often, however, it was the good management of the Queensland site from the very beginning, which was the foundation of that feeling of camaraderie and the feeling of family within the Brisbane factory. And it can be argued that this is the keystone of its success. For the greater part of the duration, the factory was run by a gentle, Danish gentleman called Mr. Martin Christopherson. Now, Christopherson came to Brisbane after the war and he founded the Arctic Ice Cream Company in 1923, a company which was set up to produce and market the Eskimo Joe. Arctic Ice Cream amalgamated with Peters in 1927 to become the Peters Arctic Ice Cream Co. and Christopherson became the managing director of the company where he would stay until his death in 1952. He was also an original member of the Legacy Club. He served as a Danish coal site in Queensland for eight years, and by all reports, he was a top guy. It was common practice to walk up to the factory, ask Mr Christopherson for a job, be hired on the spot, and then work your way through the company for the remainder of your working life. Why would you leave, some of the people I spoke to told me. In those early days, most people who worked there did so for life, and there was a strong emphasis on skills development with people within the company and training and being promoted from within. So one may start in the loading docks, but throughout their working life be upskilled to do tasks all across the factory. This was quite common for many of the people that I talked to. They said they stayed in their factory because you could and you would be promoted. You didn't have to look elsewhere to move ahead. As one worker said to me, it's simple, you're appreciated. I spoke to a gentleman by the name of Danny Mills. This is Danny sitting on a Peter's delivery truck with his brother, Daryl. Now, Danny shared with me many stories and images from his father Pat's time at the factory. Pat had worked from the factory from when he was 14, starting in 1937 and working up until 1983. So Martin Christopherson, as part of his work with Legacy, had begun to offer assistance to dependents of those killed or injured in the war. Pat's dad had been gassed and disabled in the war, and Christopherson offered 14-year-old Pat casual work so that he could earn money and still complete his schooling. And so Pat joined the company two days a week in the stockroom and worked his way up until he was offered a manager role in 1968. This image is of Pat's 40 years service letter. It's very short, but a very personal letter. You'll note that it's from Queensland United Foods. So Peter's merged with Paul's Milk Factory to become QUF in the 1960s. And it was a long history of Peter's and Paul's working together. And this is Pat and his wife, Maureen Mills, and their entry in the annual Peter's Carnival. Now, as I mentioned, the company merged with Paul's and then it was bought by Nestle in the 90s. And a great resource on Peter's company itself is the book Of a Nation by Michael Harden, which was published to coincide with the company's 100th anniversary. And this book is available in the State Library and some local libraries, and it provides a really great insight to the company as a whole and the values that Fred Peters instilled, which were carried across the states. But the Queensland factory was a great place to work. There was a cafeteria that provided low-cost meals to its employees that always had a morning tea or an afternoon tea, or if you worked the early shift, you could get a breakfast there. There were change rooms with lockers and showers. There was music that played through the factory during the day, and of course, the social gatherings. There was an annual picnic at each of the factories, and reportedly, the Brisbane factory was the best. Fred Peters would travel up to the picnic each year and they had games and food and it was a day that the factory closed down and everyone came together. Through all the different manifestations it took over the years, everyone I spoke to mentioned the parties. The image you're seeing now is from the 1930s Christmas party, which in those days was usually held off-site in the Lone Pine area, but over the years it moved back to being held on the gardens in front of the factory. So Christmas parties saw bonuses and ice cream cakes to take home with the family. There was always plenty of ice cream to take home. So the children of the factory workers had a love of the family too. Indeed, that drove an unofficial policy within the company to encourage families to work at Peter's also. And some of the workers spoke to said that there was a great focus on them recommending people to get jobs, which in turn made the factory seem like a giant extended family. At the West End factory, the jobs weren't outsourced to other companies, as is common practice today. So up until the late 18, 1980s, the factory employed plumbers, electricians, cleaners, carpenters, mechanics, and every role that you could think of was hired as a Peters employee 
rather than a contractor. And with this came that real diversity in hiring. As we've heard, there were strong German, Polish and Russian migrants who worked at the factory, particularly during the post-war settlement. And in the mid-century, both the Greek and Vietnamese populations were increasing in West End. And so the factory itself became this multicultural epicentre. The ice cream factory, the milk factory and the other light industries in the area were all employing people of all different backgrounds in jobs across all different skill levels. And they really were drawing in more and more of that cultural diversity to West End. Many people I spoke to talked of this and the cultural sharing that rose out of it, particularly in the lunchroom. There were lots of homemade lunches brought into the factory, reflecting the variety of different cultural backgrounds of workers. And the workers I spoke to enjoyed absorbing these other cultures and occasionally trying the food. Some of the female workers I spoke to said this was particularly significant to the women working in the factory. So they'd bring in their leftovers, food that they'd made for their own families and food which had significance to their own culture, and they'd bring it to the lunchroom and they'd talk about it and they'd share it together. The workers enjoyed sharing their cultural knowledge and they had great respect for each other in the factory. There were no fights or disruptions or animosity and they formed this own multicultural community inside the factory with tolerance and respect that went on to influence West End culture beyond those walls. The actual mechanics of the factory is fascinating. The machines ran from 7am to 3.30pm without stopping unless something happened which forced a temporary closure. On the factory floor itself, all the machines were crewed up with an extra person so people could take smoko, lunch, toilet breaks. But most interestingly of all, the workers rotated on the machines every 15 minutes so they got a break from that repetition to add a bit of variety to the day. The workers running the machines were mostly women. During the war, there was an increase in women in the workplace and after the war, women continued to keep the factory jobs and Peters continued to draw lots of women to the rest end factory. These women worked hard, they worked fast, they stuck together and they made sure they had each other's backs. One of the people I spoke to said it was daunting starting on the machines. It all went super fast and the boxes would start piling up as you were packing them. And of course, if you missed it, there's a chance it could all end up on the floor. But the girls were always paired up and the spare girl, she would have your back and she would quickly grab these boxes piling up or clean up anything that might have fallen on the floor. And of course, over one day, you could start on the have a heart machine, move to the two litre ice cream, then the four litre, and then the drumsticks. As each machine was different, and required a different approach. It allowed the women to have different physical movements, removing the strain on their backs, their arms and their necks for doing the same movement over and over again. The factory was an enjoyable place to be. The pace could have been stressful, but the fact you were in pairs and you rotated meant that it was interesting and less monotonous. Many of the women who sat on the factory floor moved to other roles within the factory, contributing their diverse set of skills to the company. A few women I spoke to talked of themselves and other women spending time on the floor before moving over to the lab and taking on roles which were more processing than packaging. Others were directly recruited into the lab and marketing and played pivotal roles in the development of new products. One of the food technologists hired in the late 80s I spoke with was Debbie Ryan, who was one of quite a few female scientists employed in the labs. And together they would devise and develop many iconic products. She said the marketing department would give them a demographic or a colour and they would go off to the lab and work on their own creations, whatever they wanted to imagine. The samples would be sent up to the huge freezer on one of the upper floors to freeze up and they'd go up there, up five storeys to collect them, come back down and take the samples down to the factory workers for testing. So in her time, Debbie worked on things like this special Donald Duck ice cream and of course she worked on the very iconic Frosty Fruits. Indeed, a few of the ice creams she works on today are still in production. But the food technologists, the managers, the marketers all gave credit to the entire co cohort of workers for an ice cream success. One of the people instrumental in building those links between the floor staff and the other teams was the floor team leader, a gentleman by the name of Peter Ware. And this is an image of Peter when I visited him last year and he's holding a photo of his team. To be honest, almost everybody I spoke to during this research said to me, have you spoken to Peter yet? He was such an influential figure during those last few decades of the factory. 
Peter's worked at the factory for 35 years and has an unparalleled knowledge of the operations from the mix room to the engine room to the refrigerators to the loading docks. And he was really a key contact for me during this project to give an extensive overview of the factory operations and all the different forms that the company took during the 80s and 90s as it changed ownership. From the way the tanks were set up with flavours and the elaborate conveyor belt system which would shimmy the flavours across the floor to the right machines, Peter oversaw it all. Six lines went to the ice cream section, four lines went to the ice block and it was at one stage Peter's job to make sure all the mixers went the right way and the machines kept on running. Both Peter and many other people I spoke to really again stressed it was the dedication of the people within the factory that were the driving force of its success and how this internationalisation and intergenerational workforce really drove the factory and the love that people had for the product made the workers feel deeply loyal and want to make the best product they could. But looking beyond the factory walls now, we can see the impact of the factory on West End itself. The factory played a large part in the internationalisation of West End due to its large migrant population which was employed at the factory. The factory workers and their families brought to West End a community of cultures which set a social heritage in place. This diversity was reflected in the shops along Boundary Street and the vibrant community who selected to move there. Now there have been many changes to West End over the past few years and the gentrification of the area has seen many of these niche stores change to businesses which reflect broader trends and classes. A very small number of, of establishments on Boundary Street today were actually around when the factory was operating up until its closure in 1996. Things which drew people to West End was that authenticity and that eclectic community. And whilst it's somewhat more of a trendy place these days, the factory and its workers really contributed to the foundations of this social heritage of West End and shaping that local streetscape. And with the changing of how people are using and adapting space in West End, the capturing of these collective narratives and these social histories, as well as the physical heritage we see with the building, becomes increasingly important. So 93 Boundary Street today, as a social, cultural and economic space, is obviously very different to when Peter's Arctic Delicacy Co inhabited the building. And whilst it's a beautiful looking set of bricks, it's just a set of bricks. The importance of the site sits within the workers who came and made it the factory and made West End their home. This is an image of worker Bob Brennan, who I was fortunate enough to do a walkthrough of the factory just prior to the latest renovations. Had the factory not have been successful and had an early closure, the building may have most likely been demolished or repurposed and it would be just another building on Boundary Street. But the workforce and the way the West End Peters team created and maintained that culture within the factory is what makes that building iconic. Even today, many pass by thinking of the conveyor belts moving the haver hearts and the drumsticks from the machine through the blast tunnels and into the back of trucks. We think about the millions, trillions of tonnes of ice cream which the workers made and was then shipped out interstate into ice boxes of the local convenience stores. We think about the iconic advertising campaigns, the different flavours, the little promotions that they would run. And this in turn makes us think about our own personal connections to this product in this place. This collective narrative that we're building and the ways that we connect to this place are really important parts of our social and cultural histories. One of the things I was really interested to discuss with many of the former workers is how they felt now having been part of such an iconic brand and part of such an iconic space, which is really a source of happiness and good memories for so many people. And of course, all of the people whom I spoke to felt much joy in their, their little or their big part in this. They may have been operating a machine or working in payroll or driving a truck, but they felt a deep connection to the family of the factory and a sense of value in having played a role which is deeply etched into the memories of so many. And there's not really other spaces and products that have such a widespread reach to bring so much happiness to people. And this project has brought joy to many people and the people that I spoke to who've enjoyed reminiscing about their time in the factory. And I hope there's something that brings you, gets you thinking about your own narratives, be they your ice cream memories, your West End memories, or perhaps stories you might now think of when you pass the building in the future. I'll leave you with a quote from Debbie, the food scientist whom I mentioned earlier. She said, 
And that's the power of the narrative, isn't it? That others will know the story. I often look at the building and I think, oh my goodness, the number of people that have gone through there and the years and hours of labour, and for so many of them, it was as migrants. This was their new charts of life and they just grabbed it and they ran with it. There was no kind of resentment about where they had come from or where they, why they had come from their countries. It was just embracing life for what it was. I'd like to thank the sponsors of this project, Sekasui House West Village and the fabulous team at the State Library of Queensland. The support and guidance of Gavin Bannanen, Christy Theodosio, and Turncliffe and all the teams in assisting with this project have been wonderful, as is their ongoing commitment to preserving the social and cultural heritage of Queensland in the John Oxley Library. And of course, my many thanks to all who took the time to speak to me about this project. Hi, welcome back. <clears throat> well, thank you so much. And um, I hope you enjoyed that presentation from Tricia King, our 2019 Placemaking Fellow. Uh, I'd just like to, if, if you had any lag issues, I apologize um, on the video. We will be making this video available um, through our website um, after this session. So you'll be able to, you know, go back and do the catch up TV thing with this presentation as well. And also I encourage you to share it with your friends and family. Um, but now we've got the opportunity to ask some questions to Tricia. And so welcome, Tricia. Thank you for coming in live and in person. I like your background. Thank you. So, thank you so much. I really appreciate it. Um, so I'll, I'll just ask a few questions and we've got some um, free time now to, to sort of delve uh, a little bit deeper in some of those themes. Mm -hmm. I just also, uh, people who might be a bit new to Zoom, um, you do have the opportunity to ask questions there's a little icon down the bottom of your screen called Q&A. You can just type in questions um, and send them through to us and we can put them to, put them to Tricia. But uh, Tricia, I was just gonna kick off um, mm. by just asking, I, I was really, uh, the idea of imagination, you know, this equipment, these people, these operations, that they aren't there anymore. And I, I suppose how important was it for you to have that to build in that sense of imagination of so, so that people could, to me, some of the power is how you imagine it would have looked, felt and, and smell. Like it was a very visceral kind of experience in, in the factory. Um, do you want to talk a little bit about imagination? I think that's, um, that's exactly it, Gavin. Um, if you drive past the factory today, um, it, it really, it, it, that, that set of bricks does produce that taste and that smell, um, and it, and it and you really get a sense of that. It's uh, it's it's something that um, we all uh, we all have experience with. Um, for for many of us, um, it's a product that is an integral part of our own memory and our own experiences, and often childhood and things like that. So to have the opportunity to listen to the lived experiences of people on the floor of the factory and have them be able to, to round out that sense of, of, of smell and bustle and, and the livelihood of the factory was, was really integral to this project. And I think it's, um, it's, it's what really gives the project life is to be able to ingest, ingest that, uh, that, that, that lived experience that, you know, the working process of it and, and, I don't think it, you know, hearing about all of the different machines and, and how they went this way and that way, I don't think um, removes any of the mystery, but I think it adds to, to what we understand and adds to our imagination. And I think it actually opens possibilities when you hear stories from the floor that um, the workers could, could really, you know, particularly the, the food scientists could create anything they wanted to. And there was that unlimited possibility to it. And they were really uh, uh, representing the entire factory. So I think, um, I think the project adds to our imagination. It doesn't, uh, it doesn't demystify anything, but it actually makes it, um, it, it rounds it out and really adds to the stories that, that we all have. Yeah, I mean, just talking about an ice cream factory is just like, Wow, you know. Yeah, um, yeah. Yeah, yeah. So I was just going to, um, there's a, thank you. There's a few questions coming through the Q&A. Um, just a nice message that I just wanted to acknowledge from Sandy Catalucci. Um, 
who just wanted to say thank you for the amazing and well-informed presentation, Tricia. Beautiful. Thank you so much, Nanny. I really appreciate it. I was um, tasked with a, a, a rather delightful subject um, to, to look into. So it has brought a lot of pleasure to, um, to some of the workers who, who had so much fun reliving those experiences. And I also spoke to a lot of, um, of children of factory workers who contacted me as well. And, you know, it was such a big part of their life. And I think um, to, to honour their parents in that way, to be able to tell their stories, I, I think is a, is a wonderful thing. So I really um, appreciate your positive feedback. Now, just on that sort of thing of, of the people, um, question from Tricia Fielding uh, about how did you go about identifying the former employees and how did you go about contacting those people? How did you start? Yeah, well, it's um, it's interesting. Obviously, the um, the the new owners of the building had um, already had a few contact lists, but I also went immediately. I think the day after the project was awarded, went on ABC um, radio and and had a chat about the project and got a lot of people through that as well, and also um, through our website. So I um, I went out and spoke to a lot of people uh, early on in the project. Obviously, this project. Um, uh, COVID happened during the middle of the project, so it went from face-to-face -face, uh, meetings uh, to, to chatting over the phone, so it sort of changes the nature a little bit, um, but it was a lot of leads of a leads of a leads, down a little rabbit hole, somebody knew somebody, there were a lot of people who still catch up from the factory. Um, and so I was able to connect into those groups as well, but a lot of, um, a lot of people came forward because it is it is a, a wonderful subject and, and a lovely project. So I um, did get a lot of people raising their hand and wanting to tell their story or their family's story. And, and just one of those people, it sounds like we've got a message from Julie Miles that her father Cliff is participating today. He's 91, but spent his working life with Paul, Peters, Pauls and QUF. Um, he's the writer of the Danny Mills letter. <laughs> Oh my goodness, that's amazing! Hello, hello, Cliff. That's so <laughs> wonderful, and I would, um, I would love to connect with you after this project, uh, after this webinar. We'll share some details, and wow. also, um, Chris Chang has just um, said it's been a great, great presentation. Long time since I've heard such a great project. Can I ask how you initially stumbled upon the topic? Well, the, through the, the State Library of Queensland Memory Awards, um, this was a topic which was sponsored by the current um, owners of the land, Sextui House, West Village. And I was drawn to the project because my background is through telling stories of, of lived experiences. So I'm a photographer. I particularly work with, um, with older people in aged care is where I'm from, but I'm used to, um, my, my work is really about, uh, about telling stories. So I was really drawn to this, um, this project and, uh, and to the, the Peters company because of the wealth of stories that, that were within the building. So that's, that's kind of how I came, um, came about it. Um, but just one thing that I was just struck by, and this would probably make sense if you've seen our other presentations, but we had um, a presentation from our John Oxley Library Fellows, um, Matthew um, Vengert and um, uh, Louise Martin Chu, which was about the government printing office. Mm -hmm. And they also looked at the, we would call it now workplace culture, but it was basically how those people in the printing office kind of did playful things, which for their own entertainment, but would you kind of call it bonding or something now? Did you want to talk a little bit about the workplace culture and the things you saw um, come through in, in the research you've done? Yeah, and that was that was really the big thing that came through. I think if you were to load all of my interview transcripts into a word cloud, the, the word that would come out would be camaraderie. And, um, and I think that workplace culture was so strong in the factory, um, and they did they did bond considerably. Uh, not only because of the internationalisation and the intergenerational nature, and everyone was 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 put in there, but also they knew that they were working on this iconic product that was bringing so many people um, happiness. So I think that um, that was a real driver for a lot of people. And that was something that we touched upon in the interviews. Um, I also think that um, 
the management really worked hard to create that culture to really um, reduce the hierarchies in workers and present an overall workforce and um, and that was something that really again came through and I, I spoke to to people from the loading docks through to um, state sales managers and they all reported the same thing that they all felt part of a family and were fostered as such to feel part of this family and I think the um, the gardens had a lot to do with it and all the parties that were thrown on the on the gardens and of course you know all the ice cream that was sent home to the children um, made the families of the workers love the love the place too. We've got a few more um, it's fabulous and um, keep sending the question through so um, so a question from Roberta is that um, she understood the Webster family were also involved in setting up the Brisbane factory. Do you know anything about their involvement in setting it up? No, I don't know about the Webster family. I know about um, Mr. Christopherson, but I don't know a great deal about the Websters. I have seen their name in passing, um, but I'd be keen to explore more. Obviously, the the people that I've spoken to were from the, 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 the later end of the factory operation, just given the nature. I mean, the factory closed 25 years ago now. So um, it is an, an aging workforce. So I spoke to a lot of people who were there from the 60s onwards, um, but I'm keen for any information um, you have on the, on the earlier dates, if you can point me in the right direction, that'd be great. Thanks, Trisha. And Roberta points out that she thoroughly enjoyed the webinar, so thank you. <laughs> um, probably we're getting to the last opportunities to, to throw a question through, but probably an, another one from me. And you, I think you subtly make the point in the presentation that um, the building is the building made out of bricks, but within that there is a lived memory which is intangible and sometimes what makes something unique. Did you want to, I mean, there's obviously a lot of, you can heritage list a building, but it's difficult to heritage list um, those intangible memories of um, what it's like to work on the floor and those conversations and that connection. Did you want to talk a bit about that um, built versus intangible heritage? Yeah, that, that's really important. Um, creative placemaking in a project like this is, is really important for communities in that way because it allows this understanding of our histories and it, it gives communities um, moving forward a, a, a greater understanding of community identity. And, you know, and sometimes that, that doesn't come from just looking at the bricks and mortar that comes from those those lived ident lived experiences and, and those stories that happen within, within a place. And what these stories can do is not only can they they validate the experiences of of the workers and give them a, you know the, the sense that they're being heard but it allows the current communities living in west end living in the buildings passing west end to to have a greater sense of belonging so um yeah, placemaking is more about you know communities and cultures and spaces and how they work together to inform that collective identity. So I think there's there's a lot in the stories that you know that 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 won't be found um, in in photographs and won't be found in in sales slips and things like that. These are the 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 experiences of people who were producing the product that we know and love, who were working with each other who were um, enjoying that space and having that space. And also really importantly, um, this was a big life for a lot of people working in the factory, um, coming, coming to West End and, and being employed either, you know, as, as a migrant, there were a lot of migrant people in the, in the factory. Um, and this was a place of, of hope and a place of opportunity um, for everybody there because they did make a point of really um, upskilling everybody in the factory. And so to, you know, to have these stories as somebody um, living now and working in West End and seeing the building is really important to, to, to think and feel about those stories and think about the people who were in that building and who, you know, who gave so much of themselves to create this really iconic product that we, you know, we know and we love and is here to stay. And is every time you go grocery shopping, it's, it's there in the freezer. 
Thanks, Tricia. Um, we've got a range of um, just acknowledgements and um, those kind of things. So Danny Mills, um, I think, said Danny. thank you and, and well done. <laughs> thank um, you, Danny. I really appreciate all of your help. Um, there's also a question from Tricia. So she's talking about published output for the project um, other than the talk. Um, I mean, I can talk a little bit about, you know, blog posts and that sort of thing, but mm. I suppose how, how can people connect with the content of this um, project, you, you know, beyond this presentation? Yeah, well, um, in addition to the, the blog post, there are going to be a, um, there is the website as well, which is bangingthedrumstick.net, and the stories will be um, heading up there as they're formalised, but also the um, the stories uh, and the, the artefacts that I found will be um, going into the State Library of Queensland collection. So that's another way to connect with them. Um, I do plan on writing uh, a little bit more about the stories as well, because there's, there's a lot to tell and there was, um, as you can imagine, I've been working on this project for uh, for the for a year. So there's more than I could fit into this 20 minute session today. And that's that probably leads into another question um, for you know if you could keep gathering um, these important memories, yeah. what would be the next chapter or area of focus for your research? You know, look as a visual artist, I would I would love to to move to a more um, to to start documenting visually. And of course, with COVID, as I said, it, it moved. I started taking photos really really early of of Peter and and Bob when we did the um, the walking tour around the factory. And I would love to create more visually that can be used in. I know the um, the current owners do uh, ice cream festivals and things like that. So I think um, I think that would be the next chapter is is creating maybe digital storytelling and and pulling in people that way. Um, I'd love to hear more about that really early section and deep dive into that because as I say everything or not everything but a lot of what I heard was sort of this later part of the factory and you have to think that there were a lot of technological changes that happened in that factory over the course of time. I mean, a few people that I spoke to that were there for, for 30 odd years talked about how um, they used to test the fat content by, you know, um, microscopes and, and measuring cups and Bunsen burners. And then, you know, by the end of their time there, it moved to fully automated. So there's a lot to, to uncover too to in that, um, that technological processes that happen within a factory as well. And I would love to sort of deep dive into that, that a little bit more as well. Um, just probably a comment from um, somebody here where they're saying that some workers first worked at Paul's, then were introduced to Peter's when they were combined. Um, mm. And that, you know, that's, that's a common sort of you know that 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 level of um, detail in the story often gets gets confused. That 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 kind of um, the separate but but joined together stories of Pauls and Peters. That's that's right. And they did they did um, co-inhabit a little bit and then formally formally merged uh, when I when um, Pauls was flooded in 1974. A lot of workers came up. I think Peter also had great stories about how they were uh, using. The factory to do these two different outputs between the Peters and Pauls, um, and there's there's a lot of rich history in there as well about how the factory operated. But they came together under that um, Queensland United um, Q, QUF uh, brand and operated there from the um, mid '60s onwards. And that sort of that really that changed the factory a little bit and influenced the culture because they were bringing in these outside people. But that is, you know, that's also a big part of it. And then, of course, it was brought out by Nestle in the mid '90s. Um, some interesting information from Roberta here about David Webster, who is apparently the founder of Shingle Inn and also Webster's Biscuits. Oh, yeah. yeah. So. Um, so from Mervyn Webster's contribution to the Under the Lino project, David was a committed Christian and he and Clara taught Sunday school for many years, as well as uh, David serving as president of the Queensland Baptist Union. He's also well known in business circles with who's who's listing him as the inaugural president of, of West End Arctic Ice and the sister company Townsville Arctic Ice, forerunners of Peter's ice cream. So. Oh, thank you, Roberta. That's um, yeah. 
it's really great information to know and um, will will set me off on another another tangent. Um, well, thank you so much for your generosity and all of those questions. And um, uh, thank you so much, Tricia, for your um, outstanding research, your time and your passion and commitment to this project. Thank you so much. Thank you. I really, um, I really appreciate all the support of the State Library and of the sponsor, Sekisui House. And I really appreciate the, um, the, the people who have come forward and, and spoken to me. And obviously there's, there's quite a few waiting in the wings who have more information and, and want to have a chat. Um, I'm so privileged to be able to spend time researching something that means so much to so many people. So it's a, it's a real privilege to be able to do that. Thank you. Everyone loves ice cream. I, th I think that, you know, that's really been the, the, the kind of thing that brings... Yeah, everybody. if it was a shoes factory, we'd be having a very <laughs> different conversation. I don't know, shoe people. I, um, <laughs> uh, I, I would just like to conclude by just thanking again the Queensland Library Foundation for their support, Sekisui House Australia West Village for their support as well. This wouldn't have happened without them. I would like to also, as Tricia said, thank all the participants in the Banging the Drumstick project. And I'd also just personally like to thank you, Tricia, for making this all, all possible and making it so fantastic. Thank you. Um, I'd just like to remind people to go to the Queensland Memory Awards webpage if they themselves are interested in doing their own research journey. Um, you can also see when we talked about the blog, um, sorry, we just get in our own um, vortex there, but that's the John Oxley Library blog will be where um, some of the research outcomes from, Tr from Trisha's project will be um, displayed. That's the John Oxley Library blog. Um, you can also find out about the 2021 Research Reveals um, series, uh, which uh, this is the last of the four. So, you know, it's been a, been a fantastic series of four talks, but they will start up again in September um, with the model for delivery. Um, we'll be investigating that depending on our COVID status, but um, you'll be seeing some fantastic research projects and, and the outcomes of those so I just encourage you to keep up to date. Um, and if you are looking to submit your own um, application, 25th of March is the due date for, um, for the 2021 Queensland Memory Awards. So thank you very much. I hope you have a good evening. <laughs>